No surprise, because the 19th century was an exciting time that marked the birth of folklore studies in America. Exhibitions that featured recognizable motifs were often the most successful. In fact, the original intent of the American Museum, which exhibited countless human displays, including Chang and Aang for a six-week engagement, was to preserve and collect. The exact same impetus for the establishment of the American Folklore Society in 1888. The connections between folklore and the displays of humans with abnormalities are numerous, to say the least. Whenever there was a human being on display, the focus was placed on the narrative. But when there was a material object on display, the focus was on the object itself. And as a result, for living exhibitions, the narrative became a critical part of the display. My purpose is not to say that only those familiar with the particular motif may have found it interesting, but instead to present the possibility that the majority of the public had an affinity towards motifs that featured remarkable beings, even if they were not familiar with the corresponding narrative. Just as we may be familiar with motif, motif G219.5, Wrinkled Witch, or motif G308, Sea Monster, or motif G304, Trollless Ogre, we may not recall in our memory specific tales about these motifs, but we realize that they are familiar and we can conjure images of these motifs in our mind. In the form of folklore stories and exhibitions of Chang and Aang, we're able to mask or address larger issues, giving the American public the opportunity to negotiate through newly emerging concerns. And I believe it is the use of folklore that allowed exhibitions like Chang and Aang to be a specific form of entertainment in 19th century America where the public came together regardless of age, gender, or class. And perhaps it could be defined as what Victor Turner would describe as an instance of communitas, where patrons are betwixt and between, in a liminal space where normal societal laws are temporarily suspended. The widespread appeal of this narrative sanctioned the integration of the heterogeneous audience, and essentially the patrons once we understand the pervasiveness of folklore, we can see that Chang and Aang were part of a larger narrative, one that the public collectively understood within the context of folklore. For example, Chang and Aang were exhibited all over the world, but were denied entrance into France because of the fear that their presence would cause, de cause deformities in, un in the unborn and would have a, quote, disastrous effect upon pregnant women. Here, yet another recognizable motif, T550.4, monstrous birth because mon mother sees horrible sight, was combined with motif 523, Siamese twin, to form a new familiar narrative surrounding Chang and Aang. Chang and Aang may have appeared as a simple oddity that captured America's attention, but there was definitely something more going on. Folklore has been said to act as a mirror for the rest of culture, help us form and express identity, and to enable us to better understand ourselves and others, yet it is rarely applied to research and disciplines outside of folkloristics. The importance of recognizing folklore is undeniable, and I propose that the instantiation of specific motifs like Chang and Aang were a direct reflection of the era. Once we notice the use of folklore, we can begin to study exhibitions from a different perspective. I would even dare to complicate things and suggest that the presence of motifs in exhibits is possibly a form of folklorism or folklorismus, which is a process of adaptation, reproduction, and transformation of folklore, but I'll save that conversation for another time. At this point, I will leave you with the celebrated edict of Alan Dundee's Folklore Matters.
African woman brought to Europe and displayed for her supposedly uh, freakish and extraordinary um, bodily configuration, pelvic configuration. And, you know, she, in the 80s and 90s, there were a lot of articles, scholarly articles done about her and a lot of presentations. And then a certain level of resistance or critique of how her story and in particular images of her, of her were being used rather uncritically in these studies. And um, one of the things that came out in all of this work was the way in which um, medicine or science was used to make images that would in other contexts be considered pornographic or obscene uh, be considered instead acceptable and important for science. And so there's a lot of analysis of how uh, for example, the doctor who dissected and preserved parts of Bartman's body lingered and uh, over her body described it very sexually. And so I think that there's an extent to which, in fact, it's not only an analogy, but a kind of pornography <coughs> of the freaked bodies that we're talking about. Um, so that's all in which to say that, again, without being fully versed in the current debates in pornography studies, I think my answer would be that um, it's not possible to look without um, there being that element of pleasure or what, what in this case is most often described as fascination and curiosity. So again, it's a matter of having our critical awareness about where the pleasure or the curiosity or the fascination comes in rather than denying that it's there. But I also think on a very practical level that there's the question, just as you're saying, that who do you show these images to? How do you show them? Where do you show them? Can you ethically engage with the subjects of the images themselves and ask yourself, for example, in the case of uh, pornography, right, there's the question of what is the effect of the image, there's also the question of what went into making the image, what were the economics, were the uh, particularly women um, involved in making the images, did they have agency or were they pressured, right, so you can bring all of those questions into just the way that images are deployed. I hope that answers. I wanted to ask Cynthia about the remark about the, um, whether or not Canadian would be considered Asian American or not. Um, and also identify myself as a member of the Foster family. So. Oh. <laughs> and I'm really enjoying this. Okay, um, the question is, um, can you speak more as to whether or not the Foster family is cons considered Asian American? And um, when I first started this project, um, I actually couldn't imagine a family that was further removed from what my understanding of an Asian, Asian American family was, um, because this is a family that um, they're descendants of the former Confederacy. Um, they seem to be, um, they, they seem to lie outside of these familiar um, narratives about the history of Asian America, whether it stems from a history of pre-1882 migration or post-1965 migration, somehow um, this Bunker family trajectory doesn't seem to fit into these um, familiar um, meta histories of how Asian America coalesces. And yet, um, when I spoke to these actual Bunker family members, they seem to have a very high level of sophistication about um, US racial politics, um, about social change and about social justice. Um, a lot of them spoke to me about um, what their place was as um, people who were phenotypically white while living in North Carolina at the time of the Civil Rights Movement. So um, there's actually a very high level of um, intellectual sophistication with which many of these bunker descendants talk about race and social change in the United States. And, um, when I was thinking about um, the type of work that comes out of the field of Asian American studies, um, especially in the late 1990s with the advent of the transnational turn, um, we all know that um, you know, culture, culture and politics here is um, dislocated uh, from geographical space or a nation such that it's very possible for um, people with Asian descent to be living in the United States, but not having an Asian American politics, or not having um, a social identity <coughs> that's organized around um, thinking about um, pan-ethnic organizing, cross-racial organizing, 
believe that's true. I, I think that many of the descendants there um, are operating with a very high level of sophistication about race in the United States. question for Lena. Um, I, I wonder if you could say more about the immigrant context in which the folklore was uh, um, doing its work, the, the context of, of immigrant audiences in the U.S. Um, well, um, just from my preliminary research, um, although this whole topic, <laughs> I could write a dissertation on it. I've actually noticed, um, and I even did a calculation about 67% of all of the motifs that were um, represented in displays of humans, particularly those with abnormalities, were Irish um, or claimed to have Irish origins, or not even that they were originating there, but that they existed in Ireland. And I did notice that um, the majority of the folk motifs that um, corresponded with displays in 19th century America um, were analogous to those who were participating. So they were primarily English, Irish, um, and Dutch. So there's, um, 
definitely something there. But we'll have to read my dissertation and we'll have to finish it before I tell you exactly what it is. Um, I, so I actually have a question for you that comes from the production of the show. I see like that. Um, so I was the, the dramaturg on this on the show. And early on um, in our work together, it's still fascinating, it's really a great question that I didn't have to ask before. Um, I, which was to what extent was their fame in China fame driven by the fact of their race and the fact that they were so close to they were Chinese at the time and they were so connected to the Chinese in the United States? And to what extent was their
female bodies and black female sexuality for everyone was increased. Um, I mean, Just time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to take a little bit of an invitation to dialogue about your kinship uh, work and that section of the book. Um, I'm a little troubled because um, I'm very interested all the time we have right now. We do have a break, so people can talk more to the panelists and, of course, uh, in the later breaks and at the reception later. So thanks to all three of you. your seats. I um, want to thank our first round of panelists. Uh, even thinking about some of the imagery and anecdote that came forward from our last panel and thinking about uh, Lena telling us about um, early um, fantasies and wonderings about what would happen if Chang and Aang were drunk. Um, you're going to see a representation of that, of that image later this, later this evening. 
or in Cynthia talking about the Bunker family and about the reuniting of the Bunker family, I feel like there's a moment in the play later to, where you get a kind of image of the, the wider family and its assembly um, that is resonant for me. So I think that um, some of the triggers that they shared with us, the motifs that they've shared with us already are things that you're going to see explored and repositioned um, this evening. Uh, having lingered um, specifically and poignantly on the issue of conjointness per se in our first panel, our second panel today is assembling a terrific group of scholars who will be sharing uh, a, a more macro vision of some of the issues around popular performance, the representation of difference, um, issues of race, ethnicity, um, and popular culture that have came up in the first panel and that were part of the questions that were asked. And so I think we'll be able to continue the conversation that was launched in that first panel with the contributions we have on offer today. The group assembled is varied, um, but similar in the fact of their, in their shared distinction. Uh, I'll introduce all three panelists now and allow them um, in an in-order presentation and allow them to come up um, one after another. First of all, Samuel Otter, as you read from your bios, is a professor of English and is um, the campus's uh, leading expert and indeed one of the leading um, experts in um, the country in the field of 19th century American letters and culture. He's particularly known for his work on Melville and for his new book, um, Philadelphia Stories and for the attention and rigor and imagination that he brings to issues of um, culture, manners, the formation of character, issues of race, freedom, and violence as they percolate and uh, animate 19th century literature and culture in the United States. And he is also now the department chair of the English department, and I'm so pleased we were able to spring him from those duties and able to, so that he could come over to remind us um, of his unique status um, as a 19th century um, American Studies scholar. Eric Hayo has flown in from Penn State University where he directs the Asian Studies program. He is um, a scholar of uh, Asian Studies widely construed uh, and in particular he has a uh, in the large field where scholars and contemporary critics are thinking about the Western pro projection and imagining of uh, Eastern peoples, especially representations of China in the Western imagination. He's really emerging as um, one of the leading scholars of his generation in that domain, and so we're so pleased to have him here. And finally, uh, Ama Garti Tago Kutin, who is uh, with us um, at UC Berkeley here for two years as a Mellon postdoctoral fellow, having finished her PhD in performance studies from NYU writing a brilliant dissertation that she's turning into a book on popular display and the politics of racial display in world fairs in the United States also will be contributing her perspective as an historian of that era. Uh, and I should also make a plug now that she is simultaneously exercising other skills in uh, devising a new original performance um, based on that historical material that will be premiering in theater, dance, and performance studies um, Durham Studio Theater uh, in late April. So, without further ado, we'll have Sam start us off. Thank you to Shannon for the introduction and to Shannon and Sue Schweik for organizing the event. And um, I appreciate all your coming. And thank you uh, particularly Philip Cotanda, Peter Glazer, and Shannon Steen for the wonderful production, which I saw here last Sunday. It's a little strange and interesting to be on this stage. It's uh, quieter and lonelier than it was last Sunday and will be tonight. When the popular newspaper columnist Sarah Willis Parton, known as Fanny Fern, reports in 1854 on her visit to P.T. Barnum's American Museum, she stares at the sights before her, and she asks improper questions. 
Her responses can help us to think about the 19th and 20th century fascinations with Chang and Aang, the original Siamese twins, who were joined by a ligament of the chest. The kinds of fascinations that Philip Gotanda stages in his play, I Dream of Chang and Aang. Gotanda dreams about the twins, he meditates on the public's preoccupation and his own. Fanny Fern, without transition or subordination, describes site after site in Barnum's museum. She moves from Madame Clofulia, the bearded lady of Switzerland, to classical statues of Venus and Cupid, to Chinese figures, to depictions of the Greeks who fought against Turkish occupiers, to Queen Victoria's baby carriage, to birds and strange fish, to Barnum's contrived happy family displays in which stuffed predators are arranged in cozy proximity with their natural prey. Here is what Fern writes about the bearded lady, who herself makes a cameo appearance in Gotanda's play. This is Fanny Fern. One of the most curious curiosities ever presented, a card in pleasant juxtaposition to the lady conveys the gratifying, gratifying intelligence that, quote, visitors are allowed to touch the beard. Not a man in the throng lifts an investigating finger. Your penetration, Madame Clofulia, does you infinite credit. You knew well enough that your permission would be as good as a handcuff to every pair of masculine wrists in the company. For my own part, I should no more meddle with your beard than with Monsieur Clofulia's. I see no femininity in it. Its shoe brush aspect puts me on my decorum. I am glad you raised it, however, just to show Barnum that there is something new under the sun and to convince men in general that a woman can accomplish about anything she undertakes. <laughs> I have not come to New York to stifle my inquisitiveness. How did you raise that beard? Who shaves first in the morning, you or your husband? Do you use a woman's rights razor? Which of you does the strapping? How does your baby know you from its father? What do you think of us smooth-faced sisters? Do you, between you and me, prefer to patronize dressmakers or tailors? Do you sing tenor or alto? Are you master or mistress of your husband's affection? <coughs> Barnum's displays often hinged on the boundaries between categories. Here, here, female and male, elsewhere black and white, and human and animal. Inspecting the bearded lady of Switzerland, Fern meditates on the invitations and prohibitions in Barnum's museum. She puns on identity, gender, and sexuality. She ventriloquizes the indecorous questions that she imagines are on her readers' minds. Do you prefer dressmakers or tailors? Do you sing tenor or alto? Are you master or mistress? In Barnum's museum, such curious curiosities stage an intimacy that generates ungentlemanly and unladylike questions, not only about the object, but also about the relationship between viewer and viewed, or, as Fern puts it, between you and me. Barnum played a smaller rather than a larger role in the public performances of Chang and Aang. Born in Siam in 1811 to Chinese parents and already aspiring entrepreneurs, they were brought to the U.S. in 1829 by a Boston sea captain. The historian Robert Bogdan describes them as, quote, the first truly nationally known and universally popular curiosities in the United States. After three years under contract and on display, Chang and Aang took control of their own business affairs and toured to wide interest and large audiences. In 1839, their profits allowed them to purchase a plantation and also African-American slaves in North Carolina. They took the last name Bunker, became U.S. citizens, married in 1843, had many children, and as Bogdan puts it, flaunted their American ways. They did contract with Barnum for a six-week appearance at his American Museum in 1860, and in need of money after financial reverses during the Civil War, they went on, to, they went on a European tour sponsored by Barnum in the late 1860s. They died on the same day in 1874. Gotanda transforms and incorporates much of this complex history, personal and national, 
including an especially powerful scene about racial violence, which invokes one of the play's refrains. To quote a line from the play, they have not seen the likes of you, either in color of skin or shape of body. Shape of body. That does seem to have been a core fascination for many 19th century observers of the twins. We might stand in Fanny Fern's position and imagine the questions generated by the sight of Chang and Aang, and also invited by their own publicity. Are you two or one? Can you live, in quotation marks, normal lives? How do you function? Who feels what during sex? Do you ever have any privacy? Do you feel the same emotions? Do you have the same tastes? Don't you ever get tired of one another? The biographical answer to this last question seems to have been yes, as the brothers became estranged despite their self-promotion. Do you want to be separated? Can you be separated? Mark Twain plays with some of these questions in his contribution to the array of 19th and 20th century portrayals of Chong and Aang. In a sketch titled Personal Habits of the Siamese Twins, first published in 1869 and frequently reprinted during his life, Twain riffs on the divisions of two in one. This is Twain. The twins always go to bed at the same time, but Chong usually gets up an hour before his brother. By an understanding between themselves, Chang does all the indoor work and Aang runs all the errands. This is because Aang likes to go out. Chang's habits are sedentary. However, Chang always goes alone. The humor, so far, while effective, is a bit too easy, premised on the binary coercions and compromises of split cells. The situation becomes more complicated as Twain won't let go of the joke and goes on in the sketch to articulate the personal with the historical, quoting Twain again. During the war, they were strong partisans and both fought gallantly all through the great struggle, Aang on the Union side and Chang on the Confederate. They took each other prisoners at Seven Oaks, but the proofs of capture were so evenly balanced in favor of each that a general army court had to be assembled to determine which one was properly the captor and which the captive. The jury was unable to agree for a long time but the vexed question was finally decided by agreeing, by agreeing to consider them both prisoners and then exchanging them. Here the twins can simply go along. Their intimate divide opens up questions about personal possession and about the possession of persons, about the distinction between captors and captives, questions that require the intervention of courts and an absurd but appropriately tautological judgment. The twins are exchanged for one another. The judgments are harsher as, this, and this, as a series of jokes is extended even further in Twain's 1894 novel, The Tragedy of Puddinghead Wilson and the Comedy of Those Extraordinary Twins, a book that Twain himself theatrically splits in sutures. In the second part, he describes the complications that ensue when two Italian twins, Luigi and Angelo, are introduced into the setting of Dawson's Landing, a small Missouri town before the Civil War. Twain used Chang and Aang as models for this novel, and also probably Giovanni and Giacomo Tocci, who became the focus of interest in the late 19th century. The Tocci brothers were connected from the sixth rib downward and had one pair of legs, a single abdomen, four arms, and two stomachs, hearts, and pairs of lungs. Contemplating Angelo and Luigi, the townspeople in Twain Dawson's Landing debate whose arms and hands belong to whom, and what pronoun to use when referring to the brothers, he or they. Luigi and Angelo profit from their circumstances by being able to book both seatings for dinner on Mississippi steamboats, and they're able to pay for only one bed in hotel rooms, but they're charged double, according to the narrator, for tickets to peep shows. One twin complains to another about the tightness of their shoes, pungency of tobacco he smokes, the strength of the whiskey. Luigi and Angelo are acquitted of assault after a jury cannot determine who is in charge of the leg and foot that did the kicking. The trial judge warns that such a result threatens to undermine the foundations of society. When Luigi and Angelo run against each other for aldermen from opposing parties, the town bifurcates into factions. Luigi is elected as a Democrat, while Angelo loses his bid as a Whig. But
but Luigi can't be sworn in because Angelo is not an elected member and the city government stalls, since without Luigi, the votes on the board are evenly split. After the courts decide that Luigi can't be seated and Angelo can't be admitted, the townspeople, as Twain writes, quote, come to their senses and hang Luigi. Those extraordinary twins end with an execution or executions rather than an exchange of prisoners, as was the case in the personal habits of the Siamese twins. And Twain sharply portrays the categorical imperatives and fatal choices that follow from the unsettling encounter with Luigi and Angelo. As Gotanda will in I Dream of Chang Yunane, Twain suggests there is another perspective. Depressed sometimes about his relationship with Luigi, Twain's Angelo always regains his composure. Quoting Twain again, ventriloquizing the character Angelo, to be separate and as other men, to be separate and as other men are, how awkward it would seem, how unendurable. What would he do with his hands, his arms? How would his legs feel? How odd and strange and grotesque every action, attitude, movement, gesture would be. To sleep by himself, eat by himself, walk by himself. How lonely, how unspeakably lonely. No, no, any fate but that. In every way and from every point, the idea was revolting. Twain and Gotanda consider such defamiliarizing reversals, suggesting that the questions generated by the conjoined twins reflect on observers as well as their objects. This putting into question of the normal has, of course, become a crucial aspect for many disability studies scholars. A striking feature of I Dream of Chang and Aang, as presented in this theater last Sunday when I saw it, is how those indecorous Fanny Fern type questions are raised and staged. Before the audience, scripted and choreographed, with a physicality that would not be nearly as effective on page or screen, the bodies of the two actors playing Chang and Aang are joined by arms around shoulders and waists. They are clipped in a vivid red harness. They are seated back to back. They lean on and against one another. I think they love, sort of. They face each other. They touch foreheads. They separate. They fight and dance. The meticulous bodily choreography neither reifies nor erases distinctions, insists on fluidity rather than fixity, educates and titillates, reminds us that the two actors are only temporarily joined and that a clip on a harness is not the same, or is it, as a band of cartilage or a shared liver. Those questions, that curiosity persists. I take the spirit of this symposium to be, uh, like the subject or subjects of this new play, uh, simultaneously single and double. Single because everything in it, at the end of the day, will return, thanks to the performance, to history, and dramatic representation uh, uh, of the lives of Chan and Bunker. Double because in each presentation so far, uh, we've been directed towards a secondary or tertiary context through which the lives of uh, Chan and Eng themselves proper mean uh, or mean differently than, than, uh, than they do on their own. Each of these new contexts amounts to a kind of multiplication of signs, a doubling or redoubling, 
It is recaptured every time by the larger context in which it occurs, namely the lives of the Bunker Twins. This dance of single and double can be summed up, uh, not for the first time in human history, by a brief and unfortunately only citational marriage of the Spice Girls and Mao Zedong. Uh, tonight is the night when two become one. As Baby uh, sang in the chorus, a line to which Mao, ever mindful of the dialectic, inevitably adds uh, one which divides itself into two. This I take to be the basic, basic mystery at the heart of our fascination with the forms of kinship, personal, familial, genetic, social, and racial uh, surrounding Chang and Ang Bunker, the Siamese twins. My job is to place that mystery in yet another context, the history of the representation of Chinese bodies in the Western world over the last two centuries. Uh, this is going to be a race through that and, and uh, just a brief stop at a couple places in it. Uh, more specifically, I want to put the bunkers within the frame of specifically medical representational histories, that is, histories in which the representation or live performance of the Chinese body occurs within an essentially or partially scientific context. Uh, as we know from the history of the bunkers, but also from the entire history of freak shows, medical oddities, and other displayed bodies from the way back to the contemporary reality show. Uh, in the modern period, there's always been a significant overlap between the putatively scientific and the essentially curious or voyeuristic. The putatively scientific context always has a potentially anthropological uh, frame. Let me begin with a simple example. Uh, this image, which appeared in an 1801 book published in London called The Punishments of China uh, by George Henry Mason, uh, this book, uh, which appeared in actually a series of books uh, uh, which were titled uh, The Costume of Various Places, Great Britain, Russia, Austria, Turkey, uh, is the only book in that series that was actually titled uh, The Punishments of Blank. So it's an oddity uh, uh, within its own context. It's uh, a series of images painted uh, uh, or uh, drawn rather by a Chinese artist who's known only as Bu Gua, uh, Gua is a sort of nonsense syllable added to a lot of Chinese names in the period, so his identity is un un unclear. Sold as a, a deck or a set uh, to uh, Western tourists uh, in Canton uh, as an illustration of the Chinese judicial system. So their image is produced specifically for export uh, and designed for an export market that is curious about these kinds of things. That is, that, you know, assuming intelligent business people, uh, this image is a register not of what uh, someone like Bu Gua uh, would have painted on his own, uh, but something that someone like Bu would have produced in a factory that was designing these sets of images for export. Uh, this is the culprit before the magistrate. It's followed by a series of punishments that get progressively more severe. Uh, here's one that's later in the image. Um, and what these illustrate uh, is, is uh, the beginnings of a fascination that uh, then goes on, uh, sort of goes back a little bit earlier in, in textual terms, but continues, I think, to the present. Uh, on uh, of a fascination that's lo located mostly in Europe and the United States uh, and directed almost entirely towards the pain of Chinese people and uh, pain both the Chinese people inflict on one another and, and uh, also their, uh, the indifference of Chinese people to that pain that is in this image, for instance, the indifference of the guy who's choking the guy uh, to his pain, but also frequently, and then somewhat surprisingly, and I'm, we'll see some images like this in a moment, the indifference of Chinese people to their own pain. Part of the argument of the book that I published a couple years ago uh, is that uh, these, uh, these images uh, register the effect on the European worldview of the sympathetic revolution that began in Northern Europe in the late 18th century, uh, in which in the process of becoming modern, Europeans and Americans discovered that part of what made them modern and what granted them the right to intervene in the rest of the world was that they were unusually sympathetic from a global perspective to the suffering of others. Uh, irony. Uh, this meant in turn that they became quite interested in circulating images and narratives that effectively demonstrated the other's indifference to suffering, as these images attempt to do. So uh, let's now look at some medical examples. These images are from, uh, oh, this is another costume of China, so that would be a traditional image. These images uh, are uh, painted by a Chinese painter known as Lan Gua, about whom we know quite a lot, uh, who was trained as an oil painter in Hong Kong. Um, they were done of the patience of the man on the left, who is Peter Parker, uh, that is also a Lan Gua uh, portrait. Uh, Peter Parker was a graduate of Yale uh, who opened the first missionary hospital in China, that is the first Western missionary hospital in China in 1835 and worked there from 1835 to 1855 on and on. It's a complicated long story. Um, he specialized in two kinds of operations, operations to remove cataracts where uh, the West <coughs> had and American medicine had uh, a significant competitive advantage relative to the Chinese market. 
and also operations to remove large uh, vascular tumors, uh, which you see here. Uh, Lenfois, whose son was an assistant uh, to Parker, uh, uh, painted these portraits on, uh, on Parker's behalf, but, but did so as, as is widely reported for no money because Parker took no money for the operations, and so there was kind of a sense of exchange. Um, the striking thing about these portraits, and I'll show you more about them later, is, is obviously the kind of putative stoicism of the, of the faces in them, and, and there are 85 of these portraits, most of which are in the medical library at Yale Medical School. Um, the other thing that's kind of striking about Parker's uh, life is that he wrote uh, case uh, reports for most of the surgeries he did and published them widely. Um, and in those case reports, he described uh, the Chinese uh, uh, who, who, on whom he operated, he described their reactions to surgery. This is, remember, before anesthesia, although Parker was actually the first person to use anesthesia, chemical anesthesia, in a Chinese operation. But these two reports I'm giving you below are actually uh, uh, written uh, regarding uh, Chinese patients don't have anesthesia. And um, you see in the first one, which is uh, on the upper left there, um, her fortitude exceeded all that I could wis witness. She scarcely uttered a groan during the extirpation, and before she was removed from the table, clasped her hands and with an unaffected smile, personally thanked the gentleman who assisted on the occasion. Uh, and the other one, the amputation was speedily performed, and the patient sustained the shock remarkably well, considering his loss of blood and the time that it elapsed. He spoke in an energy <coughs> voice the moment after. This is coupled with uh, other stories, and there are really 20, 30, 40, 50 of these that you can find. Uh, in which, for instance, patients ask whether the operation has begun yet immediately after the operation is over. A very interesting moment in the registration of uh, what are obviously socially different attitudes towards pain and suffering. Uh, what I'm also interested in is, is that in many of the portraits, uh, we find uh, in them an impulse to twin that demonstrates the widespread appeal in the representation, uh, and as a feature of representation, of the notion of doubling and redoubling, though in this case, as in, I think, case often, I mean, although I'm thinking of, of, of Lena's presentation on the, the twin, sort of the, the, the twin as a, as a kind of motif in, in folklore, uh, the twin is, twinning and doubling is also obviously a kind of important symbolic motif in, in the aesthetic more generally. And I want to give you three images here that I'll talk about a little more. Uh, um, but uh, very quickly, the woman on the left, who obviously has an enormous uh, uh, tumor growing out of her neck, uh, that image clearly doubles the earrings uh, and the tumor. In some sense, in the way that they hang and the circular shape of the bottom of the ear and the tumor. Uh, in, the, in the image in the middle, which you can't quite see, uh, the uh, little girl who's being held by her mother uh, has had her feet bound. They've become gangrenous, and uh, uh, they're, they're sort of black, and then you can, you can see down to the bone, and these feet have been amputated. Uh, and the little girl's life is eventually saved. Uh, but these, of course, feet are paired uh, uh, structurally and, and obviously visually and thematically with her mother's feet, which are bound but not. And uh, the image on the right is one of a series of images uh, in which uh, a tumor is likened to a breast. And, and obviously, there, there's no reason for this woman on the right uh, to hold open the, uh, the top of her garment uh, in order to witness the tumor, except for the symbolic demand right, that's being placed on the image by that desire to sort of twin uh, the structure. Um, I think we see some of the impulse. I'm going to just change the image, and we'll get to this in a bit. Um, but for, I don't like leaving those things hanging around. Um, uh, I think we see some of the same impulse to double, actually, in, in uh, Philip Cotton's play, uh, in which the couple, for instance, Learned Jack and, and Good John, uh, reproduces in a sexual matrimonial registry the homosocial doubling of the two brothers. Uh, we are being invited, I take it, once again, to ponder the mystery of uh, two becoming one, becoming two. Uh, not just in Chang and Heng, uh, or Jack and John, but in the doubling of the example of the former two and the latter two, the thing that allows us to recognize Jack and John's relationship as an imperfect uh, twinning of Chang and Heng is the same thing that allows us to recognize in twins, probably any twins, not just conjoined twins, a kind of imperfect and mysterious doubling, which is also weirdly a singling, a single and a double all at once. Uh, this is the, the, you know, the thing that allows the contrast, or the, that produces the demand for the contrast between Motif is, is the obvious similarity between them in the first place. Otherwise, the contrast is not interesting, right? It's only interesting if you have an, if you have an apple and an orange. It's not exciting to point out that one is an apple and one is an orange. But if you have two apples, one of which looks exactly like an orange, that's interesting because the sort of fundamental similarity right, allows us to sort of generate excitement at the level of contrast. Twins have always been associated with magic and otherworldliness. 
conjoined twins, one might say, and simply make the magical connection we imagine exists between singleton twins, biologically literal. Um, I mentioned parenthetically that the character of the horse, uh, I haven't seen the play, so I'm, I'm basing the remarks on the script. Uh, uh, the character of the horse, this remark that it can be played by one or two actors, I have no idea which it, it, it actually occurs, uh, but it's another place in the play where the single double theme is, is sort of getting enacted in the stage directions. That Chang and Aang were historically singled out for the privilege of forever representing that doubled singleness, most prominently, of course, by the fact that they lent both their ethnicity in Siam, where they were known as the Chinese twins, and their nationality in the West uh, uh, to the term Siamese twins uh, uh, is, 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 of course, one of the startling features of their particular history, over and against the history of other famous conjoined twins. The name persists as a slightly milder version of the kind of leftover racism that appears in words like Jipped or Jude or in a phrase like the Spanish, hay uh, moros en la costa, there are moors on the coast, which idiomatically means something like walls have ears, but is obviously a reference to the dangerous or, or secretive proximity of the moor uh, to, to your secrets. But in any case, it's clear that the effect of that name in the 19th century is something like the effect of those portraits of Chinese people with their tumors, uh, signifying not only in the medical register, but also in the anthropological one, the strangeness and magic, the backwards and backwardness and primitivity of both Siam and China, are figured by the images in the name through which they call out for the future viewer sympathy, even as they confirm his or her sense that uh, we are dealing here with an image that comes to us from another time or another space. What's different about Chang and Eng is that they didn't want your sympathy, uh, or at least didn't seem to, the capacity of the performer, Chang and Eng Bunker, for instance, to display him or herself as a case is justified in advance by the fact that she or he is already a display case, a case that merits, for whatever reason, being put on display, but also in the stronger sense, a case that holds something meant to be displayed, a body that is essentially the bearer of itself as an example of something else. And I'll come back to these images, which I think are, are clearly bearers of uh, uh, something that is both on their body and of their body, but also exceeds their body and surpasses their body. That's the reason, uh, among other things, that these people are being painted, is not because they are particularly interesting at the level of their personality accomplishments, but because in fact they have some part of their body that, that somehow allows them to rise from uh, being poverty stricken, which most of them were uh, Chinese workers, to the kind of people who get oil portraits done of them, uh, which is obviously a very different class of people in historical 